Good morning, church. Happy Thanksgiving to you. Uh, I'm going to read some uh, portions of Psalm 136 as our call to worship. And um, this psalm is uh, rather repetitive. And so after every verse, I want you guys to say, His love endures forever. So let's try this. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. Give thanks to the God of gods. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. To him alone who does great wonders. Who by his understanding made the heavens. Who spread out the earth upon the waters. Who made the great lights. The sun to govern the day. The moon and stars to govern the night. Give thanks to the God of heaven. His love endures forever. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, our hearts are full of gratitude today for who you are and all that you have done for your children. Lord, and all you're going to do, we can have a sense of anticipation in our hearts. We love you, Lord, and we want to express it today with words of praise and thanksgiving from deep within our hearts. Pray that you would receive them today and smile upon your children, and we ask it in the name of Jesus. And all God's kids said, Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and worship, or you can remain seated if you like, whenever you feel comfortable. But let's praise His holy name this morning. Hallelujah. It's the Word. The most powerful thing in the universe is the Word of God. Hallelujah. Oh, God of burning, cleansing flame. Hallelujah. 
praise you, God. Hallelujah. By the way, that's a very dangerous prayer. How many of you know that? Jesus, send the fire. Jesus, burn up everything in my life that you don't like. Hallelujah. It's a good prayer, though. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has the greatest. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done greatness. He has done greatness. sing that I just want to let you know something I had Rebecca sing that because I was putting into the face of the devil today because she was bought by the blood of Jesus Christ and she had times in her life when she struggled even as a pastor's daughter but I was putting it in the face of the devil today because she has been won by the blood of Jesus Christ and for me that is the most important thing because that meant a lot to me amen amen Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. And you may be seated. We're going to share in the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is called uh, communion or the Eucharist. And the latter term Eucharist, it comes from a, a Greek word that literally means give thanks. In Luke 22, when Jesus instituted this meal, breaking the bread and drinking the cup, it says he did so by giving thanks. At the Lord's Supper scene in, in Luke 22, 19, when Jesus shares the bread and the cup representing his body and blood, he gives thanks for them. And then he says, do this in remembrance of me. Thanksgiving takes place by God's people remembering the ways and the works of God. 
They give thanks not as some courteous nod to God solely for a gift received like you might do for Aunt Sally in the socks she sent you, but instead giving thanks as a heartfelt act of gratitude for how someone has shown kindness to you. Remembering and thanksgiving are joined together to recall God's goodness, his faithfulness, his power in the past, and to remind us God will do the same for us today and tomorrow as well. Remembering God's past work leads to trusting God's work in the future. And today we do the same in the Lord's Supper as we give thanks and remember Christ. We remember Jesus, the sonless Son of Man and the Almighty Maker in one person who died on a cross as a substitute for you and for me. His body was the bread broken for us. His, his blood was the wine crushed and poured out for us. At this meal, we remember Jesus by recalling his sacrifice as the only hope for forgiveness. We recall the immeasurable love and grace of God to send his only son to deliver us from sin, to defeat our enemies and to set us free. We remember God has been faithful and has abundantly provided in Jesus everything we need to answer our deepest problems and our deepest longings. When we remember the sacrificial death of Christ, we give thanks for all these things that we now have in Him. We give thanks remembering God's work in the past that remains true for us in the present and also in the future. In remembering and giving thanks for these things, we're reminded in this meal that Christ is our Lord today and His salvation continues even as we feed on Him now. The same God who held nothing back in sending Jesus will hold nothing back from what we need today and tomorrow. The same God who defeated the greatest enemies at the cross will defeat the enemy in front of you this week. The same God who provided himself so kind, so faithful, so strong and so good through Christ's work is the same God who today promises to continue to be kind and faithful and strong and good to us. The God we give thanks to as we remember all that he's done is the God we now trust by looking to him for the great things that he will do. If you haven't received your emblems this morning, there, um, you can find them in the front lobby there. And as we sing this next song, just prepare. Again, there's two layers. The first you can tear off will reveal the wafer and the second uh, will reveal the juice. And so if you can do that as we sing this next song. Let no one caught in sin remain Inside the lie of inward shame But fix our eyes upon the cross And run to Him who showed great love And let church. Christ is risen from the dead, trembling over death by death. Come away, come away, come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead, we are one with him again. Come away, come away. You bow. 
dead Trembling over death by death Come awake, come awake Come and rise up from the grave Christ is risen from the dead We are one with Him again Come awake, come awake Come and rise up from the grave Amen. Amen. He's victorious because he's victorious. We're victorious. Apostle Paul said, I received from the Lord what I also passed unto you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the wafer together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's drink together. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We share in the Eucharist this morning, Jesus. First of all, it says that you gave thanks. And that's hard to imagine when you knew it was coming. But you could even see beyond the cross and the pain, knowing what this would accomplish for your church, for all those who would believe that they could experience a mighty salvation and sins forgiven. So we give thanks. We give thanks that we are blood-bought children of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we're part of the family, that we have a wonderful inheritance, and that, Jesus, we're proclaiming your death and all that it accomplished, but also we're proclaiming your coming again, and we'll talk about that later. We'll rejoice in that later. Right now, we just want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you for all that you've done, all that you've accomplished. Lord, for mankind, but for us individually as well. And Lord, we rest, Lord, in this assurance and this hope. And we give you thanks and we give you praise. In your wonderful name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's continue to worship him this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. about 
church, I will call upon your name. I will call upon your name. Keep my eyes above the waves. The ocean drive, my soul will rest in your embrace. I am yours. You are my spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. My faith will be made stronger. The presence of my Savior, Spirit, Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Me walk. this morning. Praise Him this morning, church. We praise you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. Draw us by your Spirit this morning, Lord, to the deeper waters, to the deeper things of God. In Jesus' name. Jesus, I will call upon your name. Here we go. I will call upon your name. Keep my eyes above the waves. Notions rise, my soul will rest in your embrace. I am yours. I am yours. You are mine. I am yours. Sing it, church. You are. Believe it this morning. I am yours. You are mine. For I am yours. You are mine. For I heart this morning. You belong to him. You are not worthless. You are valuable. He died so that you might live. He loves you and he's pursuing you with all of his heart. Allow him to touch your heart this morning. Who are you? You are loved. You're a child of the King. There's a place in heaven that remains for you. You are valuable. He spent his all for you. Let go of the past. Listen to what he says about you. Open your heart. He's not going to be like the other people in your life who have hurt you. 
He will love you and he will embrace you. He will not beat you up, but he will cherish you and he will reach out to you with loving arms. And he will help you. He will heal you. You will be made whole. Amen. your song church I was lost but he brought me you know his love for me oh his love for me who the sun sets free always oh, free in me I'm a child of God yes I Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I love that song. I love the truth of it, hey? We're his children. We are his children. I'm a child of God. Hallelujah. I don't, uh, there's a lot of times I don't feel worthy to be his child because I mess up so royally and so often. And uh, I'm just glad that his, uh, we said at the start of the service, his mercy endures forever. Amen. He's a good, good God. Let's get our Bibles out this morning. And let's say our pledge together today. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. Today I will be taught the Word of God. 
I boldly confess, my mind is alert, my heart is receptive. I will never be the same. I am about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. I will never be the same, never, never, never. I will never be the same, in Jesus' name, amen. As I've said many times already, it is Thanksgiving Sunday, but I am going to break with tradition and not preach a Thanksgiving message. <laughs> Instead, I would like to continue with our series on the end times. And so today I'm going to look at something called the rapture. Now, if there is one thing we should be thankful for, it's the fact that Jesus has promised to return for his church. So maybe it's a bit of a Thanksgiving message. Uh, one thing I do have for you today, though, is a Thanksgiving illustration. I've been sitting on this one for months, and, and I, couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't wait to share it with you. So I'll share the illustration, then I'll get down to business, okay? So this is just straight nonsense. So here we go. Uh, a young man named John received a parrot as a gift. And the parrot had a bad attitude and an even worse vocabulary. Every word out of the bird's mouth was rude, obnoxious, and laced with profanity. John tried and tried to change the bird's attitude by consistently saying only polite words and playing soft music and anything else that he could think of to clean up the bird's vocabulary. Finally, John was fed up and he just started yelling at the parrot and the parrot yelled back at John and John shook the parrot and the parrot got angrier and even more rude. John in desperation threw up his hand and he grabbed the bird and he shoved him in the freezer. And for a few minutes the parrot squawked and kicked and screamed then suddenly there was total quiet. Not a peep was heard for over a minute. Fearing that he hurt the parrot John quickly opened the door of the freezer. The parrot calmly stepped out onto John's outstretched arm and said, I believe I may have offended you with my rude language and actions. I'm sincerely remorseful for my inappropriate transgressions, and I fully intend to do everything I can to correct my rude and unforgivable behavior. And John was stunned at the change in the bird's attitude. As he was about to ask the parrot what had made such a dramatic change in his behavior, the bird continued, May I ask what the turkey did? <laughs> ah. I trust you have a Thanksgiving gathering that you are looking forward to with family and friends this weekend. Uh, for believers in Jesus Christ, though, there lies before us a guaranteed future event that should ignite an excitement and passion greater than any holiday, vacation, trip, or earthly adventure ever could. As the centuries, years, and months of the church age continue to tick by, we should grow in anticipation of a supernatural event that we are destined for, the instantaneous catching away of all true believers in Christ. It is the next thing on the prophetic calendar, and it is an imminent one, meaning it could happen at any moment. This evacuation operation is known as the rapture. Ephesians 2.2 gives this title to Satan. It calls him the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Jesus himself will invade the enemy's territory and whisk away his bride, the church, from right under Satan's nose. Here is how 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 records that event. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Then, together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. 
Generations of believers have longed to be alive when this worldwide supernatural event occurs. We don't know if we are that generation, but one thing is sure. We have more reason to believe we are closer to the rapture than any other generation in history. First, because with every second that passes, we draw closer chronologically to this guaranteed future event. And second, because all the biblical signs and conditions pointing to the tribulation are forming in our day. Many end time signs and conditions have never been so thoroughly in place for any other generation. And I spoke on it the past a couple sermons that I did. If you missed them, uh, check out our YouTube channel and you can catch up there. Some shameless self-promotion, I know. but <laughs> <laughs> You know something that, that was cool about our online viewers? Um, we got a message, I believe it was from Kenya the other day, someone that had been listening. So uh, if you're li still listening, big shout out to you folks in Kenya. God bless you. In John chapter 14, Jesus sheds light on this event along with a, a promise to return and a promise to take us with him. He said in verses 2 and 3, he says, There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. So we're given two promises in these verses. One, that Jesus himself is leaving to go and prepare a place for us. And two, that he is going to come again and receive us to himself. So let's just take a quick look at those two promises. Scripture tells us that all creation was made through Christ. He was also most likely a carpenter by trade before he began his earthly ministry. So if it took him only six days to create the heavens and the earth, can you just imagine how amazing our future home is going to be? What meticulous care and attention to personal detail must be given to something that takes Jesus 2,000 years to build? <laughs> Second, Jesus promises that he's coming back to receive us. He's not just coming back to us, he's also receiving us. That is, we're going up to him. In other words, he's meeting us somewhere in the middle. In 1 Thessalonians 4, we are given more information about this, as well as the order of events of the rapture. The, the sub-events of the rapture will likely happen in extremely quick succession, some perhaps simultaneously. First, the Lord himself will come down with a shout. Will he shout, come forth, as he did with Lazarus from the grave? Will he shout, come up here, like he did with John in Revelation chapter 4? We can only speculate. But Christians will hear his unmistakable shout as he suddenly cracks open the sky, right in the heart of the enemy's territory. Second, it says we will hear the voice of the archangel. This is probably the archangel Michael, who leads God's armies against Satan's forces in Revelation. And he's specifically referenced in the book of Jude. And we also find him in the Old Testament book of Daniel. And in that book, he's battling against the regional fallen angels so that he can get a critical prophetic message from God to Daniel. Michael is God's top general, perhaps the same rank or slightly lower than the rank Satan had before he rebelled against God. This shout is likely a war cry given as the enemy's territory is invaded. It, it could also be the announcement of the groom, Jesus, coming to fetch his bride, the church. That was also the custom in ancient Jewish traditions. Maybe it's both. Third, we will hear the trumpet of God, the shofar probably, a distinctive blowing of a horn to call people to battle or to assemble for an important meeting or celebration. Fourth, it says the dead in Christ will rise. This is the long promised resurrection. 
What the Bible refers to as the first resurrection and the rapture are the same event. Those church age believers who have already died will receive their glorified bodies fit for heaven. You know, I'm thinking it can't get much better than this, but it can. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Father, forgive me for my <laughs> sin. <laughs> Fifth, fifth and finally, this passage tells us that, that we who are still alive, we are going to be caught up with all the other church aged believers to meet the Lord in the air. Just as believers who are resurrected from the dead will receive bodies fit for heaven, we who are also alive will be instantly changed into new bodies. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 53 describes it like this. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies will be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies bodies. Can you imagine the joy as living believers are reunited with loved ones who preceded them in death and they're gathered together before the Lord Jesus Christ in all of his glory? What can be more exciting than this? One generation of Christians will not see death. Instead, they will be changed. They will be snatched up to God's throne in a millisecond and will remain with the Lord forever. It is possible that we are that generation. What about you? What comes to mind when you think about the rapture? Instead of excitement and joy, many people experience fear or apathy or confusion. In Titus 2.13, the Apostle Paul said, we wait for the blessed hope the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The problem is we have an enemy who, who wants to steal our hope. He wants to blur our understanding of this momentous event. Don't allow him to do that. Don't allow him to steal your joy and your anticipation. Bible scholars have long debated the question, when will the rapture take place in the context of end time events? More specifically, they debate when the rapture will happen in relation to the tribulation. We'll be looking at the tribulation in a future sermon. The, the tribulation is that seven year period during which God's wrath will be poured out upon the earth. And an evil world ruler known as the Antichrist will rise to power and attempt to annihilate the Jewish people. These will be the worst seven years of history on every conceivable level. One of the in-house debates among believers who take God's word literally concerns the timing of the rapture in relation to the tribulation period. And so three main points of view exist in this debate. These views have been labeled by theologians as the pre-tribulation view, the mid-tribulation view, and the post-tribulation view. Whole books have been written on this debate. <laughs> and so today I will only quickly summarize each view. I mean, very quickly. But <laughs> I want you to please understand God-loving, Bible-believing fellow Christians think differently as to when the rapture will take place. A difference of opinion does not make them your enemy. Even within this room today, I am sure there are those who believe differently on this topic. Within our own fellowship, the Pentecostal Summits of Canada, there are those who do not believe the same. The important thing is that we hold to the fact that Jesus will return for his church, and we anticipate that. 
the pre-tribulation view teaches that the rapture will occur before the seven-year tribulation period. This is the view that I hold, just for full disclosure, okay? <laughs> the mid-tribulation view states that the rapture will occur at the middle of the seven-year tribulation period. This view is also popular even within uh, our fellowship. Probably those first two um, are the predominant ones. The post-tribulation view states that the rapture will occur at the end of the seven-year tribulation period, simultaneously with the second coming of Jesus to the earth. Now, we don't have time to go over the strengths and weaknesses of each position today. Uh, the one thing those with these differing views can agree upon is that Jesus is coming back for his bride, the church. So in light of the fact that Jesus is coming back, and soon, what should we be doing? What kind of people should we be as this incredible event draws near? The Apostle Peter asks and answers that very question. 2 Peter 3.11, you ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. Notice the three things uh, we are doing in light of Christ's soon return. Live holy and godly lives, look forward to that day, and speed its coming. Now let's think about each of those. Peter calls for God's people to, to live differently. The word holy carries with it the connotation of being set apart. Speaking negatively, this means that, that we should not participate in the world's increasing wickedness. Now, if you are a list person, I can give you one that will help. Galatians 5, 19 to 21. This is from the, the uh, passion paraphrase, and it states, The behavior of the self-life is obvious. Sexual immorality, lustful thoughts, pornography, chasing after things instead of God, manipulating others, hatred of those who get in your way, senseless arguments, resentment when others are favored, temper tantrums, angry quarrels, only thinking of yourself, being in love with your own opinions, being envious of the blessings of others, murder, uncontrolled addictions, wild parties, and all other similar behaviors. See, what God calls sin is something to stay away from even if society calls it acceptable or desirable. We're to live holy lives. We're to be, live godly lives. If you ever wonder what that looks like, we have a perfect illustration in Jesus Christ. And if you want a list for living a godly life and what that looks like, it's also found in that same chapter of Galatians. It says the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Note, a godly life can only be lived in the power of the Holy Spirit. Also, we are to look forward to Christ's return. Christians should be living in anticipation and excitement of Jesus' return. And I believe this is something we have allowed ourselves to be robbed of. 2 Timothy 4.8 uh, talks of those who, who long for Jesus' return. Have you been longing for his return? Christ's return for his church, uh, as we've already read, is our blessed hope. That day will be the best day ever. It will be like Christmas and your birthday and the best vacation all rolled into one times infinity. <laughs> Holy Spirit, stir that longing in our hearts once more. Peter also wrote that we should speed the coming of that day. It almost sounds strange, right? How do we do that? And I think the main way that we can do this is by completing the task that Jesus left for us. That means praying and actively sharing the good news with our families and our friends and those we encounter in everyday life. And it means supporting others so that they can spread the gospel message globally. The Apostle Peter had some more advice on what we should be doing and how we should be living in light of Christ's return. And so for time's sake, I will only list them today. He said, be disciplined in prayer. Stand firm in the face of persecution and attacks from the enemy. He said, stand together. 
we need our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. He said, be generous. And he said, be working, not just at your day job, but to extend the kingdom. And those two don't necessarily have to be mutually exclusive, right? You can extend the kingdom where you work. Lastly, we need to be prepared. And the chief and most important way to be prepared for Christ's return is to have trusted in him by faith to forgive your sins and to fill you with his Holy Spirit. Through Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross, he has provided a way for all to be saved, for all to be ready. Sadly, Jesus indicates that many will be unprepared for his return. Make sure that you are not one of them. As we prepare for the coming of our Lord, let's commit to living out the truth of who we are in Christ. Let's strive to live holy and godly lives so that when he comes, he will find us ready. Let's exercise the gifts God has given to us, doing the good works he has prepared in advance for us to do. Let's practice self-control and let's stand firm against the increasing corruption of our culture and the personal attacks of the enemy. Let's get as closely connected as we can with others in the body of Christ. Let's continue in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. Let's not wait to get started because he's coming soon. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we bow before you as believers in Jesus Christ and his sacrificial death on the cross, and as those who have received forgiveness, those that are your children, Lord, your saints, your bride, the church, Lord, stir within us that great anticipation of the day, the coming of our Lord in the clouds. We're longing to hear your voice that invites us to join you, that says, come on up. Come on up. The place is ready. I want to receive you. I've got the marriage supper of the Lamb prepared for us. Come and join me. I've been so looking forward to this day. Lord, may we also look forward to that day. Lord, may we also be ready, prepared, Lord, I pray for any that might be listening in this place or online. And Lord, today they would say, I'm not ready. And right where they are, they would say, Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died for my sin. Forgive me. Wash away my sin. Invite me into your family. Make me ready for that day. Lord, plant within them an anticipation of your coming. Lord, join us together as the body of Christ. Lord, to live holy and godly lives, to be spreading the word, working as one as a great army to bring in an end time harvest. Lord, may you find us faithful when you come. Lord, we're longing for the day. What a day, glorious day that will be. Amen. Let's stand together this morning. Let's sing of his soon return. In Christ alone, my hope is found. My light, my strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm to the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in First 
too. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in Till he returns or calls me home, here in the power of Christ I stand. Just to remind you, uh, our giving today, you can give on the way out. There's a plate at the back. You can give by email transfer, uh, evangelchurch at belnet.ca. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the promise that your son is coming in the clouds to gather his church. We thank you for this promise. Lord, we thank you that Lord, you have never broken a promise. Lord, help us to keep our eyes, Lord, on the heavens, anticipating that wonderful day, living as we should to honor you and carry out the task that you have for us. And we pray it in the wonderful name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, and soon coming King. Amen. Amen. God bless you as you leave today.